Just before we get into the meat of this episode, I do want to say that if you are new to Unsung Heroes, I would strongly recommend jumping over to the Discord chat for this channel by clicking the link below to vote on your favourite episodes of this entire series so far. Because of course, once we get to episode 100, we're going to look back with a community top 10 pick of you guys' favourite episodes, and we're going to see what those are. So if you like this one, or if you like other ones, click the link, jump over, and vote for all the cars you liked the most. As far as this car's story goes though, I actually like it very much so for similar reasons to why I love the Ferrari FF so much, and why it's my dream car. Because although that one has extra reasons, such as practicality, etc., I love it when Ferrari tries something that's so different to what they usually do. They do not always rest on their laurels, although they do most of the time. They do try things that are radical and wacky and different, and they're not always successful, but I'm glad that they try it anyway. Now, of course, that's kind of a spoiler, but this is an unsung hero after all, so it's kind of in the name. Now, in the 1970s, a number of people drove Ferrari 308-based rally cars in a number of events. And although Ferrari didn't officially enter them, or even build them, they did support a lot of those in spirit. And there was one company in particular who developed a lot of these great cars, which did have a lot of success in tarmac rallies, and especially in the Italian Rally Championship, again in the 1970s. And that company was Michelotto, a Ferrari dealer and a race engineering company. Now, as this developed, and as the rules changed into the what would become legendary Group B era, Enzo himself took much more of a keen interest in this developing rally scene, having already witnessed how good the 308 could be in what was essentially very close to production visuals with pretty strict rules, road homologation, all that kind of stuff. Now a lot of that was becoming much more lenient in terms of extreme modifications, silhouette body kits, all that kind of crazy stuff. And so what happened was Enzo Ferrari decided to officially partner with Michelotto to develop a Group B car for the 1982 season, and it was based yet again on a 308. But because the rules were so much more lenient, they could actually make significant changes to even the anatomy of the car, not just the aero, but physically change where the engine is, how you want it to be oriented, for instance. Now, the 308 already had a 3-litre 32-valve V8, and it was mounted transversely. In other words, it was sideways in the car. And although that's good for balance, it's very difficult to work on. And of course, between rally stages in Group B, you need to get the servicing done as quickly as you can. So what they did instead was they fitted the engine longitudinally, so in line with the car's direction, and that same 3.0-litre 32-valve V8 was heavily modified up to 370 horsepower, which was incidentally 8,500 RPM, so it really was a screamer of a rally engine, and mated to a 5-speed manual gearbox. Now, as you'd probably assume, the car did retain rear-wheel drive, and much of that, and this is going to come up again in this car's story, was inspired very directly by Lancia, because Ferrari took a special interest in how good the Stratos was, how dominant it had been in the 70s, and they took a lot of inspiration from that. It proved that the concept was sound, a small, mid-engine, rear-wheel drive Italian rally car. Now, of course, the engine and the gearbox were not where they stopped. The body, and this is actually one of the most impressive things, I think, about a car from the early 80s, was completely carbon fibre. And the vehicle was ultra light, not just because of the carbon body and because it was stripped out in general, but of course not being all-wheel drive made a difference as well. 840 kilos was the curb weight of this vehicle, which, when you combine that with 370 horsepower, gave it fantastic performance. In fact, when Ferrari tested it, they found that it could hit 60 miles an hour in under 4 seconds, and even had a top speed of 167 miles an hour, which is kind of unnecessary for a rally car, all things considered, but let's be honest, pretty badass at the same time. Now, the visual design of the car is probably reminding you of a couple of other Ferraris, both race and road, from that same era, and that's very deliberate, because this car's aero package was directly inspired as kind of a stumpier, shorter, more manoeuvrable version of the 512BB LM race car, which of course was one of the prettiest Ferrari race cars of the time, very fast machine. This one, though, much shorter, which of course gave it innumerable 
overall advantages as a rally car compared to that one. And even though it didn't necessarily have a mind-blowing amount of power, the fact that it was so light would definitely give it an advantage against the significantly heavier Audi Quattros, which were more like 1,100 kilos at the time. Interestingly though, because of the classification of Group B that this car fell into, it was forced to run with 120 kilos of ballast. But even then, that was still 140 kilos lighter than the Quattro, which at that time had no advantage in power. But right about now you should be thinking, well hang on a second, this seems too good to be true. It's an unsung hero, after all, so it can't have been successful. The legendary Quattro is a legend for a reason, so this thing can't have been good. I don't even remember it rallying. Well, there's a good reason for that, because the single biggest issue that this car actually had was that the engineers from Ferrari and Michelotto were constantly getting in each other's way, arguing and changing things. And it led to the car being delayed by a massive two years. The car was not finished until 1984 because of all of these delays, including Ferrari testing it on their own tracks, making numerous changes even to stuff like the wheelbase, major changes to the car, and ultimately the car just became too old because in those two years not only did the Quattro get faster and faster, but also Enzo and of course his engineers witnessed the failure in effect of, once again, a Lancia the 037 against the Quattro, which just didn't realistically stand a chance. So ultimately, I find it somewhat ironic that this Ferrari not only was directly inspired by a Lancia, the Stratos, but it was also kind of killed by a Lancia. The lack of success of the 037 led to its demise. And of course, the Lancia wasn't to blame, it was the engineers and the fact that Ferrari, in my opinion at least, meddled too much in the project. Who knows, if the car had entered two years prior, history could have been very different. I don't personally think it would have dominated the Quattro for obvious reasons, but it could have at least been a very interesting rivalry because Lancia did reasonably, Ferrari doing a little bit better a little bit earlier would have been pretty cool. And I find it somewhat ironic that the only Ferrari rally cars to ever have any meaningful success weren't built by Ferrari. <laughs> they were built by other people, which is kind of weird. But at the same time, Ferrari isn't a rally team, so you can't really blame them that much. Now, if you're wondering what happened to the car, actually, it's not a one-off, which you'd probably assume it would be three were ultimately built. The original was later sold to a good standing Ferrari customer. It was used in a couple of rallies. Then a second one was commissioned after news of that first one got out. That one was also used in some rallies, but was crashed and then converted for road use and sold to a different Italian collector. And then a final third car was commissioned for another collector, which commonly shows up to Ferrari events and is, from what I understand, the best condition of the three. So ultimately, it's a car which certainly has a very interesting story behind it, great intentions, and they took inspiration from cars that were great to take inspiration from, like the Stratos, but ultimately, Italian engineering, arguing with each other, the timeline getting way too long, the car arriving too late, and really just Ferrari dabbling in something that they probably should have just left Michelotto to do, caused its death, and you're probably thinking, well, all of this is very sad, but don't fear, because the car did not die in vain, because not only was this already inspired by an existing Ferrari, the 512BBLM, as I said, but also what Ferrari learned from developing this car very directly inspired a number of the choices and development stages of what would become the 288 GTO. So it's somewhat ironic to me as well that one of the most obscure Ferraris ever directly led to one of the most iconic Ferraris ever. Overall though, I find it a fascinating car with a great little story behind it, and as I said, it's probably one of my favourite episodes of this series, and it all came from just a tiny picture of this car that I saw in an issue of Classic and Sports Car back in like 2004. That was an image that always stuck in my head because I'd never even heard of a Ferrari rally car, and that image is actually the same one that you can see in this video. That iconic visual of this Ferrari rally machine taking a corner, kicking up the dirt, something which looks simultaneously so odd, but so right. 
that led to this episode. So it's funny how little things you pick up over the years kind of come back and can be used to tell what I would say is a pretty cool story. The story behind the 308 GTM. And in case you were wondering, yes, the M is in reference to Michelotto. But that's it for this episode overall. Of course, click here on screen to see all of the other episodes. And don't forget to jump over to the Discord chat to vote on your favourites. But for now, as always, thanks for watching.